Hello! Well, as you can see, this video is pretty long, but I think it'll be really interesting. This is the last part of my series of videos about the unreleased nations of Tvat, and today we're gonna talk about Snezhnaya and the Archon Quest, as well as the Tsaritsa, her elemental skill and burst, and her weapon. This video will not contain any kind of leaks, because I'm against them and I want you viewers to be able to watch the video without spoiling the game. Because this channel has a general no leaks rule, I won't allow leaks in the comments unless you write leaks in capital letters, leave a few empty lines and then write about them. That way, those who don't want to read leaks, me included, can easily avoid them. If you don't follow this rule, I'll delete the comment as soon as I see it. As always, this is a theory video. I use information available in the game, but my theories and deductions and conclusions are also based on my personal research and interpretation, so they are not to be considered the official lore of the game unless they get confirmed in the game itself in later versions. Considering the fact that I have 10 pages to read, I'd better end my intro right now. Let's start with what we know about Snezhnaya in general. Snezhnaya is a Russian word that is actually pronounced Snezhnaya, and it's an adjective that means snowy. As the wiki says, the word Snezhnaya is normally followed by a feminine noun, like Snezhnaya Stranna or Snezhnaya Zemilia, meaning snowy country or snowy land. Originally, the nation was supposed to be called Prikrasnaya, which means beautiful. Snezhnaya is the land of the Cryo Archon, the Tsaritsa, who is not the original Cryo Archon from the Archon War. We don't know her name, her Arsketia one, nor what she is the god of. I won't talk about her now because she has a dedicated section in the video. Nadia from the Northlander Bank says that she's waiting for boats coming from Snezhnaya, so the nation has a port. She also says that blizzards can last an entire month, so we can expect a weather so extreme that Dragonspine would pale in comparison. In child's voiceovers, we also learn that if you stop moving in Snezhnaya, you would freeze to death. This makes me think that, differently from Dragonspine, the sheer cold mechanics will be slightly different and it makes perfect sense. I mean, Dragonspine is just a sub-area in Mondstadt, while Snezhnaya is a whole nation. If they made sheer cold a permanent effect, navigating an entire nation in those conditions would make the gameplay pretty hideous. We will also get a new recipe for fire water, a very common drink in Snezhnaya, despite it being the strongest alcoholic drink in all of Tevat, that will probably help with the sheer cold. From Child's story, we also learn that there are frozen lakes where he and his father used to ice fish, and that there are also snowy forests. Snezhnaya is technologically advanced, probably more than any other nation, even more than Fontaine, and I guess that was possible thanks to the forgotten technology from Caria that was brought back by Piero and maybe other Harbingers, potentially Sandrone. For example, the agent's sacrificial knife's description says that it was created with superior Snezhnaya technology, and the Fatui skirmishers use mechanical suits, guns and cannons. Alice in her travel guide also says there are massive factories in Snezhnaya. Talking about the Fatui, they are the strongest army among the Seven Nations, which means that they're stronger even than the ones from Natlan, despite it being the nation of the God of War. We also know that the Adventurers Guild hails from Snezhnaya, but unlike anything else from that nation, they are not considered an evil organization. Since we talked about the advanced technology of this nation, Catherine is the bionic puppet, which explains why she is in every single nation and why she always says ERROR. Rebooting. So yeah, she's not Nurse Joy. We know of a sub-area, the seaside village of More Pesok, which in Russian means sea sand, which is child's hometown and could be the poor area of Snezhnaya. We also know that the Tsaritsa rules over Snezhnaya from the Zapayarni Palace. Zapayarni means polar, or something located beyond the Arctic Circle, and it should be a reference to the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, the official residence of the House of Romanov, the previous emperors of Russia. Lastly, Snezhnaya also hosts the House of the Hearth, a very important orphanage run by Arlecchino. The kids in the orphanage are raised to become Fatui members. The boys get the surname Snezhevich, son of snow, while the girls get the surname Snezhevna, daughter of snow. These surnames are basically the Russian patronymic, which is a second name derived from the name of a person's father. This means that the kids in Arlequino's orphanage are all sons and daughters of snow, which is seen as their father. Moving on to the next chapter of this video, let's start talking about the Tsaritsa's potential elemental skill and burst through the analysis of the cryo enemy's attacks. 
Differently from my video about Fontaine and Nutland, the cryo enemies don't have a wide range of attacks. We can basically say that there are just 9 instances of shields, 3 underground attacks and 46 attacks involving ice spikes, either from the sky, from the ground or as projectiles. Now, since the Tsaritsa is not an OG Archon, her attacks should be interpreted rather than taken as literal, but honestly, how do I even interpret them? What I can think is that she's definitely going to have some kind of shield, since elemental shields are unique to Geo and Cryo enemies, so this could be her elemental skill. The underground attacks remind me of Ayaka's Kamisato art, Senho, which is something we haven't seen in any god so far. While for her burst, I guess it's going to involve those ice spikes. Specifically, I think it's going to be similar to the cryohypostasis crystalline skirt, since it works more or less just like Ganyu's celestial shower and Layla's stream of the star stream shaker. For once, I don't really have much to say about her elemental attacks. When it comes to her weapon though, I think she's going to be a dual user. Since there are 46 different ice projectiles attacks, I think she uses either a bow or a gun since it's a Fatui thing, but we know from Venti's character story that in the past, he switched the Cryo Arc and Scepter with a Hillager's wooden club. Now, I am 100% sure they meant the original Cryo Arken and not the Tsaritsa, since she most likely became the Arken after the Cataclysm, so when the relationship was already severed, so she's not a Polar user. We also already have two Polar user gods, the Pyro Arken is definitely using a greatsword, Fossil Lore makes sense with the sword, so it just leaves out the Catalyst or the bow, and I don't really feel the Catalyst for the Cryo Arken, to be honest. I did say though that I think she's going to be a dual user, right? There is a slight chance that the shield will not be her elemental skill, but a new kind of weapon that could be introduced in the game. You know, like Mash in Fate Grand Order, she can use her shield both as an actual shield, but also as a weapon. This is also possible since we already have a character, Candace, who uses a shield in almost the same way. Now that we have a general idea of her potential skills, we should recap what we know about the Tsaritsa. As I said before, the Tsaritsa is not the original Arkan. Unlike what the wiki says, I don't think she became the Arkan before Kanria, but I do agree that she had been present in Snezhnaya for more than 500 years. Child says that she is a gentle soul that had to harden herself, and now she is cold stern sitting on her lofty throne with her cold but pure gaze. She is the Sacrosanct Cryo Archon and a true warrior, and because she dreams of peace, she declared war against the whole world. This happened because of the Cataclysm. Whatever happened in Karia changed her view on the world and she cut ties with every other Archons, especially with Venti, with whom she was close. Piera also says that Absolute peace. Such is the gift from the Tsaritsa, such is Her Majesty's benevolence. On the other hand, Scaramouche says that her love is also a form of sin. What if she's just trying to compensate for something? While Dainslev says in the trivial video that she is a god with no love left for her people. The Tsaritsa is targeting and collecting the Archon's gnosis for unknown reasons and she already obtained four of them plus her own. She is also granting her higher ranking officers with a device, the Delusion, that is very similar to a vision but with potentially fatal consequences. We know that the 11 Harbingers have a Delusion as well as the Pyro Agents, the Sinsim Mages and the Mirror Maidens. Considering the fact that Delusions are identical to Sneshnayan's vision but the element symbol is substituted by the Fatui logo, it should mean that they were created by the Fatui and not by the Tsaritsa herself. When it comes to the Travail video, the Archon quest is going to be called Everwinter Without Mercy, and the Latin inscription says Ducam Regina Mia Gloria Aut Pluribus Impar. As always, my translation is different from the one on the wiki page. I translated it as I will lead without equals with the glory of my queen. And not gonna lie, I had a really hard time translating this one, but I ended up finding the motto of the Canadian Université Laval in Quebec that says Deo favente aut pluribus impar, meaning with the grace of God without equals, which was inspired by Louis XIV of France, Le Roi Soleil, who said nec pluribus impar, with which he meant to say that he ruled over France by his powers and dominion extended beyond its borders, which is very fitting for the Tsaritsa considering how the Fatui are everywhere. What about her appearance? 
Well, you might think I'm crazy for saying this, but I do think she's going to look like Signora. Well, I mean, Signora looked like the Tsaritsa. Think about it, Rosalind burned her body and soul and transformed into a pyro elemental being. She was tracked down by Pierro, who followed the trail of smoke to find this person devoured by fierce flames and she accepted the glacial eyes of the Tsaritsa, or better yet, the cryo delusion, to extinguish those flames and get a human body again. We then have Venti who told her That smirkyware looks out of place. Did you steal it from your master's face? This could simply mean that she is imitating the Tsaritsa or that she actually has her face, that she chose to look like her. So yeah, there's a chance that we've known what the Tsaritsa looks like since the beginning of the game. Now let's get controversial here with a theory I have about the Tsaritsa. Everywhere it is said that the Tsaritsa is the god of love. Well, I don't think so. The concept of God of Love comes from the fact that Dainslev says that she has no love left for her people, basically, and only recently we got Scaramouche saying that her love is a form of sin. Other than that, nothing really says that she's actually connected to love. The thing is that, ignoring Fossilor for now, an Arkan is supposed to love the people of the nation they rule over, so the fact that she used to love her people doesn't seem such a strange thing, nor it sounds like she has to be the god of love to be able to love her own people. I mean, Barbados gifted his people with freedom since they used to be the Caribbean's prisoners. Morax protected his and Guizhong's people from raging gods, he literally moved mountains to protect them and he kept doing so for almost 4000 years, until he realized they were strong enough to live without him. Makoto loved her people so much that although she died in Kanria, she asked Istaroth for help so that an Ermosol tree could be planted in Inazuma through time to save her people from the filth of the cataclysm. A, although in a twisted way, wanted to preserve the happiness and serenity of the people of Inazuma for all eternity without change, thinking that this was the best way to protect her people. Rukadevata sacrificed herself and erased herself to save her people from forbidden knowledge, while Kusanali helped her people in their dreams despite being a prisoner. They all love their people, but none of them is a god of love. When it comes to what Scaramouche said about the Tsaritsa's love compensating for something else, I think it refers to motherhood, but we're gonna talk about it in the next two chapters of the video. So what do I think she's the god of? Well, the Spiro that, like we heard before, says that peace is the Tsaritsa's gift and benevolence, and Child says that she declared war because she dreams of peace. Now, here's my question to you. Is it more exciting to think that a god of love waged war, considering that love can be gentle or violent by nature, or is it more exciting that the god of peace waged a war against the other Archons and against the war itself, only to obtain everlasting peace? That's why I'm pretty sure that she is the god of peace. I mean, at the end of the day, we're basing our ideas just on what either Dainslev and Scaramouche or Piero and Child said. Let's move on to my signature section of this series of videos, the tarot card. If you haven't watched my previous videos, I found a connection between the hypostasis names, which are both Hebrew letters and numbers, and the major arcana of the tarot cards in order to explain the potential story of the arcans. Very briefly, so that we can avoid misunderstandings, although the Fool is card number 0, it is also the first card of the Major Arcana. This means that, in this case, the Cryo Hypostasis, Daleth, number 4, is connected to the fourth card of the Major Arcana, which is the Empress, despite it being the card number 3. Ignoring for now the fact that the Tsaritsa or Tsarina in Russia was actually the Empress, this card represents the energy of the Great Mother, the source of life-giving power. In medieval Europe, it used to represent the queen that currently ruled the land. Like every tarot card, the Empress has both a positive and negative meaning. It represents fertility, but also violent emotions triggered by ignorant and foolish humans. Basically, like a mother, the Empress can both gently or violently correct her children. Like I said before, the Empress can mean motherhood or pregnancy. This could be a literal pregnancy, but also the birth of a new idea or project in life. The card can also mean going overboard with your efforts towards other people, to the point that you're completely neglecting yourself, or that you're relying too much on other people and they're making decisions for you. What can this all mean? 
Well, like I said before, Scaramouche's words about the Tsaritsa's love being a sin and her capacity for something may be referring to the concept of motherhood, meaning that I think she had a child. This could also be confirmed by the fact that the tarot card shows a blonde woman sitting on a throne with a symbol of Venus on its side. Before you say it, Venus is indeed the goddess of love, but also the goddess of fertility, which is the overall concept of the Empress. Anyway, you will better understand why I think she had a child in my next chapter. The tarot card also explains how she left every decision in Piero's hands and she's most likely neglecting herself, thinking that he's actually going to deliver on his promises. Remember when I said that there's a chance that she's going to use an actual shield and a spear in battle? Well, originally the Empress was depicted with a specter in one hand and a shield in the other. Alright, let's move on to the next chapter of this video, which is a history lesson that will allow me to better explain my theories about the Tsaritsa. Considering how we saw earlier that the Zapoyarny Palace may be a clear reference to Winter Palace of the House of Romanov, that the Bolsheviki clothes are similar to the Snezhnayan fashion style and that the cryo Arkan is called the Tsaritsa, I think it's safe to assume that we need to talk about the Romanov and the February Revolution. Let's start talking about Anastasia Nikolaevna Romanova, which we all know as just Anastasia Romanov, who was the fourth daughter of Tsar Nikolai II and Tsarina Alexandra, the last emperors of Russia during World War I. Her parents and relatives were extremely disappointed with her birth because she was yet another girl and the Tsarina didn't seem to be able to give birth to a boy, who would become the heir to the throne. All four daughters were raised as simply as possible, they slept on hard beds without pillows, they had to take cold baths and do needlework to be sold at charity events. Anastasia was also known as Nastya, Nastas or Nastyonka, but also Malyankaya, which meant little one, or Zhvibzik, meaning merry little one or little mischief, because she was vivacious, energetic and a genius in naughtiness. One of her cousins also said that she was nasty to the point of being evil. Despite all of this, her health wasn't great and was often sick. In 1917, during the February Revolution, the whole family was placed under house arrest at the Alexander Place and later they were moved to Tobolsk, Siberia. After the Bolsheviks gained power over the majority of Russia, the Romanov were moved to a house in Yekaterinburg, where they were all executed in the sub-basement. For decades it was believed that Anastasia was still alive, which became one of the most popular historical mysteries of the 20th century, and the inspiration for countless books and movies, one of which was the animated movie by Don Bluth and Gary Goldman that we all probably watched when we were kids. Through the years many women even claimed to be Anastasia, but their claims were all disproved. The myth began because among the people found in Yekaterinburg, two were missing. The Tsisirevich Alexei, the boy that the Empress eventually gave birth to, and a girl, either Anastasia or her sister Maria. The scientists have never been able to distinguish which one they found in the house because they didn't have a direct DNA reference, so they could only tell the age and both Maria and Anastasia were about the same age and that it was one of Nikolai and Alexandra's daughters. It was in 2007 that two more people were found by a Russian archaeologist near Yekaterinburg, bringing the myth to its end. DNA tests confirmed them to be the Emperor's son and another daughter around the same age as Maria and Anastasia. Although we will never know which one is Anastasia, in the end the whole family was accounted for, so the myth couldn't stand anymore. Let's now talk about Anastasia's mother, for reasons you'll probably understand why I tell her story. Princess Alex of Hesse and Bayrein, later known as Alexandra Fyodorovna, was Tsar Nikolai II's wife. She was the daughter of the Grand Duke of Hesse and Bayrein, Ludwig IV, and of Princess Alice of the United Kingdom, Queen Victoria's daughter. Both parents died when Alexandra was very young, so she was raised by Queen Victoria herself. She was extremely religious to the point that, although she loved Nikolai, she almost didn't marry him just not to convert from Lutheranism to the Russian Orthodox Church, which was mandatory for a tsarina. 
both Queen Victoria and Nikolai's entire family despise the idea of them getting married, especially for a half German, half English woman to marry the heir to the Russian throne, but because Nikolai's father, Russian Emperor Alexander III, was sick, they were eventually allowed to get married so that Nikolai could secure the succession to the throne with a son. The Russian people didn't really like Tsarina Alexandra because they misinterpreted her shyness with coldness. She also wanted to stick to her own nation's traditions and never accepted nor tolerated the Russian ones, which didn't really help her cause, especially since she believed in the divine right of kings, meaning that people's approval was basically unimportant and unnecessary. She literally believed that the people automatically loved the empress just because they were the empress, while according to Russian traditions, they should have recognized the people and won their approval. Things went even worse when she couldn't deliver an heir to the throne since she kept having daughters. They even contracted a con artist that claimed to be able to change the gender of the child in the womb of the mother with magnetic powers, but he was dismissed and exiled after miscarriage. Then they asked a monk who supposedly performed miracles and finally she became pregnant and delivered a boy, Alexei. Because of the stress and the repeated pregnancies, the Empress' health was compromised, which led to a nervous breakdown. She also suffered from hemophilia, a genetic disorder that is often inherited that makes it hard to stop a bleeding. She inherited this condition from her grandmother, Queen Victoria, and her mother, Princess Alice, and sadly, her son, Alexei, was also hemophiliac. Because hemophilia isn't curable and the life expectancy was often really short, the Romanov hid from the people that the heir to the throne, Alexei, suffered from it. This is when Grigory Rasputin, a peasant and self-proclaimed mystic and holy man, told the Romanov that he had a cure, which basically consisted of prayers, and he soon became a very important figure of the court. He basically told Empress Alexandra that her son would have died in six months without him and that she needed him to save Alexei. Blinded by fear, she simply agreed and believed his words. Not long after, rumors about Rasputin started spreading, but I can't talk about them on YouTube or this video will get demonetized in a heartbeat. We don't really know if those rumors were true or false, but Alexandra immediately denied them, saying that saints are always calumniated. Rasputin, with Romanov's blind approval, gained lots of power, especially political power, and he literally ruled over the emperors who believed everything he said, especially after Alexei almost died because of his condition. The doctors were 100% sure he wasn't going to make it. Even Alexei himself was sure about his impending death and told her mother where he wanted to be buried. But Rasputin told Alexandra that Alexei was going to survive and miraculously he did. Anyway, Rasputin's role in the court brought more and more distrust in the Romanov's ruling during World War I and eventually the nobles, Nikolai's relatives, took Rasputin's life. Then with World War I, Alexandra became even more hated by the people because of her being half German and we already know how her story came to an end. Although what kind of makes sense that the writers could have used Anastasia's extremely famous story, I think that the Tsaritsa is going to be Alexandra, especially because of her unshakable belief in Rasputin, and I think it's clear by now that I think that in Genshin Impact, he is Fierro, the one who is actually using the Tsaritsa, the one who is both figuratively and literally moving the pieces from the shadows. Back in August, in my Arkans video, I said that the original Cryo Arkan was probably the Tsaritsa's son or daughter or one of her parents, but I was leaning toward the first option. I also excluded the hypothesis of a lover because that would be the exact same story as Signora. She loved the knight, he went to Caria to fight, he died there and she turned evil, which isn't exactly that much of an exciting story anyway. Back to my old theory, I thought that the Tsaritsa's son or daughter was summoned to Caria and died there, so the Tsaritsa became the new Cryo Archon and decided to get revenge against the Heavenly Principles who sent her kid there and against the Archons for not protecting her. This would have explained why Venti knew the Tsaritsa before Caria and the end of their friendship with the Cataclysm. After this research into Russian history, I now have two main potential theories about the Tsaritsa's story. 
My general point here is that something specific and really tragic must have happened in Karya for the Tsarita to both accept one of the Karyan mages as her right hand and turn against the Archons and the Heavenly Principles, especially considering she would know firsthand what going against the Heavenly Principles would entail. I mean, A lost her twin sister, Makoto, in Kanria, but she didn't turn against the whole world because of that, so there has to be something more behind it when it comes to the Tsaritsa. The first hypothesis is that the original Cryo Archon may have been the Tsaritsa's mother, because are we really expecting a male god at this point? Alexandra was half German and half English, which somehow makes me think that the original Cryo Archon may have had ties to Kanria. I wouldn't dismiss the possibility that the original Cryo Archon may have been half Snezhnayan and half Kanrian, which would mean that she would have turned into a monster, but I will exclude the possibility of the Tsaritsa being the child of an Archon and a Kanrian person because, as before, the Tsaritsa would have turned into a monster. The second hypothesis about the Tsaritsa story is, on the other hand, very different for the first one, but also more coherent with everything we said about the Tsaritsa so far. Like I said before, the Tsaritsa may actually be Alexandra. She may have had a relationship with someone from Kanria and she could have had a daughter, Anastasia. During the Cataclysm, the original Cryo Archon, who in this case could still be one of her parents, but it wouldn't be too important at this point, died and because of the curse, the Tsaritsa's daughter could have been transformed into a monster because the curse of the wilderness was laid upon anyone who sided with Kanria, but also upon half-bloods. Piero, the Sneshnayan version of Rasputin, then went to Sneshnaya saying that he was the only one with a cure for Anastasia, hence the Tsaritsa gave him full authority, following everything he said. This theory would be more in line with the actual Russian history, with the only difference being that the kid that needs to be helped would be Anastasia and not Alexei. And my only explanation for this is that Anastasia was thought to be dead by some and alive by others, and becoming a monster is more or less the same thing. She wouldn't be a human anymore, so she would basically be dead, but in reality she would also be still alive. Also Anastasia's story is too famous to be ignored anyway. Let's talk about Piero for a second. Him being the real mastermind behind the Tsaritsa's revolution would explain why the pieces of his chessboard are slightly different from Kasparov's match against Deep Blue. We as players are playing the original match by Kasparov and we're trying to get the opposite king, the Tsaritsa. While Piero knows the real pieces on the board and the Tsaritsa is actually the queen, while he is secretly the king. Now why is the Tsaritsa doing what he wants? He most likely promised her something in return for helping him achieve his goals. If we believe in the original Cryo Arcanist the Tsaritsa's dead mother theory, since we usually have a hint from previous quests that always seem completely unrelated or borderline useless but then turn out to be very important, like the tree from before Sun and Moon hinted at both the sacred sacred tree and to Kusanali's origin story, in this case the quest that comes to my mind is the one about the Shred and Nabu Malikata, specifically the core of Desolation Domain where the Shred tried to bring Nabu Malikata back to life. Now, if the Gnosis are the representation of the laws of the Heavenly Principles, they link the Archons to Celestia, and we know that even just two Gnosis allow greater feats, like Nahida being able to bypass the corruption of forbidden knowledge and meet Rukadevata in her memories from the past, I wouldn't be surprised if Piero promised the Tsaritsa to bring the original Cryo Archon back to life. The problem is the method, though. I've always believed that the answer has always been right before our eyes in the Travail video. Mondstadt is the prologue, Liyue is Act 1, Inazuma Act 2, Sumero Act 3, Fontaine Act 4, Natlan Act 5, Snezhnaya Act 6, but Kanria's act is hidden, or should I say glitched out? If forbidden knowledge can't bring people back to life, and I highly doubt Piero would use the same power that destroyed his own nation, well, we'll talk about that in a moment anyway, what would be the easiest way to achieve the same goal? Maybe going back in time, before Kanria was destroyed, before Gol created the monster of the Cataclysm, maybe even before the twins arrived. If you stop all of that from happening, no one would die. We could also say that we have a hint about this in the Pale Flame artifact set, when Piero says that he wants to rewrite the rules of destiny, by the way. 
On the other hand, if we believe the Tsaritsa's daughter is now a monster theory, the cure that Piero promised the Tsaritsa may not be that different. If you go back in time and you prevent the events from happening, then the curse won't happen and the daughter won't be turned into a monster. I am pretty much sure that Karya's act is gonna be the preface of the whole game, so something that chronologically goes before the prologue in Mondstadt, because it's just too obvious, at least to me, that we will be shown how things actually happen in Karya in first person. But is saving Karya actually Piero's goal? I honestly don't think so. In the Shivada Jade Gemstone, the Tsaritsa asks us to burn away the old world for her, but do mind the initial letters of old world, they're in lowercase. On the other hand, Piero promised Rosalind that her final resting place will be the entirety of the old world where the initial of the old world are in capital letters. This makes me think that although the Tsaritsa and Piero are talking about the old world, they are talking about two different places. The Tsaritsa means Tevat, this world that is ruled by ancient beings and ancient laws, so this old world that, with her revolution, will become a new and truly free, peaceful world, while Piero is talking about the actual planet that the Primordial One came back to, the old world that was ruled by the Dragon Lords. This would be a brilliant use of an intentional misunderstanding where the Tsaritsa thinks they're talking about the same thing, but Piero is scheming behind her back. Okay, history class is over, now let's talk about the Ars Ketia. When it comes to the demon name, in my Arkham video back in August, I said that her name may have been Flowers, but it's now clearly the wrong one since Havria is an alternative name of this demon and back then I didn't know. I was also made aware multiple times, still back in August, that there is a leaked demon name for the Tsaritsa from the beta version that I won't say because of the no leaks rule, but I'll just say this, it makes no sense, because it's not a name from the Arsketia and because there is already a character with the same name in the manga, so I think the developers just used a random name back then. I mean, they're not stupid, they knew that people would have dug through the files to uncover as much as they could. Anyway, I tried looking for a demon that uses eyes, but to no avail, so I decided to look for demons that had something to do with fertility or pregnancy, and I think I find someone that might be the right one. His name is Dantelion, the 71st demon of the Arsketia. He teaches arts and science and gives secret counsel since he knows the thoughts of all people and can change them at will. What convinced me about him is the fact that he can cause love between people and he can show the similitude between these people through a vision, and we know that the Tsaritsa is giving her people delusions. This demon is also depicted with many appearances, that is, the faces of all men and women, which reminds me of my theory about cryovision holders who always have a double personality or a conflict between two different aspects of their lives. The viewer Diamondo Power suggested that a potential Arsketia name could be Glacia Labolas, also known as Ka Crinolas, a demon that causes love between friends and foes if they want to, but is also extremely violent. Again, I can't really say what he incites because it would demonetize the video, but this brutal things he likes to do is what troubles me about him because we know that the Tsaritsa is a gentle and pure soul, while this demon sounds more like child's whole character story. My last potential Arsketia name may be Gremory, who procures the love of women, young and adult, and is depicted as a beautiful woman with a crown of a duchess tied around her waist, but I think I'm going with Antelian. So, now that we've explored everything about Snezhnaya and the Tsaritsa, let's talk predictions. I think it's safe to assume that Snezhnaya lies north of Mondstadt, so the northern border of Tevat may be completely frozen. This means that if Natlan is left of Fontaine, then Mondstadt, Natlan and Fontaine will border with Snezhnaya, creating three different transition areas. A foggy area where Snezhnaya borders with Natlan, a frozen lake where it borders with Fontaine, and a snowy forest where it borders with Mondstadt. We already had a foggy area in the game, Tsurumi Island, so that's possible, while we know that the other two already exist. Child used to ice fish with his father on frozen lakes, and Child again fell into the abyss while he was running away from monsters in a snowy forest. I think that in Snezhnaya City we will find multiple palaces, I guess 12 to be more specific, and we already know one. 
Considering that the Tsaritsa crossed this whole place after Rosalind's funeral, I think each Harbinger will have a personal palace, plus the Zapoyarni palace where the Tsaritsa is. I'm just really curious at this point to see Skaramusha's palace since he never became a Harbinger in people's memories. Now, this is something I've avoided in every single video so far. Do we all agree that Tevat, the inhabited land that we are exploring, is flat? Yep, I'm bringing in the flat earth theories. The sun and the moon, night and day, are shared by the entirety of the vat at the same time and despite the distance, we can see everything from everywhere. Now, why am I talking about this? There's one particular belief or legend among the flat earth theories according to which Antarctica is surrounded by a massive ice wall where it snows and hails with howling winds and indescribable storms and hurricanes. Humans can go past it because of the temperature, the weather and the perpetual ice, much like the ever winter without mercy from the travail video. Now we know that the bat, the inhabitable half, is a dome. This means that there has to be a tangible wall that delineates this dome, so this theory, at least in Genshin Impact, would make sense. Going back to Snezhnaya, it could also be safe to assume that the extreme temperatures and the unique weather may be the consequences of yet another celestial nail, since we have proof of one of them turning a whole nation into a desert. I'm expecting to meet Scarlet again, as well as we are definitely meeting Tusser, Tonya and Anton, child siblings in Morepezok. Considering how we are very much hated by the Fatui, there will probably be some kind of disguise that we will have to wear in order not to be arrested, if not worse, as soon as we cross the borders, and I think Child is going to be the one who will help us with that. When it comes to the Tsaritsa, I think we will find a broken person who has lost all reasons to feel alive, since I really think her daughter may have turned into a monster after a cataclysm. We will fight against the banker Pantalone and the mayor Pulcinella, who always have the convenient excuse to remain in the comfort of your homeland. And the latter will become a playable character since he appears in the trivial video, which means that he owns a vision, unlike Pantalone. It will most likely be either Dendro, Animo, or Hydro, considering that in the other chapters we saw Pyro, Diluc, Geo Ningguang, Cryo Ayaka, and Electro Sino. I'm betting on Dendro Pulcinella, Animal Linea Lynette, and Hydro Ian-san, for no reason at all, just a random bet. I think there are leaks about Linea Lynette's element, but it seems that I've managed to avoid them, so please don't tell me in the comments. After fighting against Pulcinella and Pantalone, we'll most likely fight against Piero, which will lead to Chapter Preface Canria, since we won't be able to stop him. The Tsaritsa, just like the other Archons, will finally face reality thanks to the Travelers, she will join our cause and she will try to stop Piero, but it's obvious that he will be able to achieve his personal goals, becoming stronger than the Archons thanks to the Seven Gnosis in his possession. If you watched my previous videos, you might be asking yourself, is this the only video without a crazy theory? Oh no 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 no, I do have one of course. I said that we are potentially going back in time and witness the destruction of Karya in first person, right? There is one deity alone that is capable of bending time, Estoroth. Here's my crazy prediction. Piero will capture either and he will be forced to use forbidden knowledge to create a new cataclysm. This will force the Archons to go to Zneshnaya to stop this again. Among the seven, there's one specific Archon that will prove to be very important, the master key of the whole world. We know that our dear friend Venti usually goes to sleep for centuries for no apparent reason and he's always been extremely sus for that. We know that the king on Kasparov's board was switched with Venti's piece on Piero's chessboard, so that's also very sus. At the foot of Venti's statue in Mondstadt we can also read the gateway to Celestia and we also know that there is a deep connection between Barbados and Isteroth. He was born from the branches of time. And one of the different ways in which we can interpret the history of Mondstadt says that the people who fled from the Caribbean pray to the god of time, asking her for help and, in that moment, a wind sprite Barbados was born. So yes, I basically think that Barbados and Isteroth share the same body and when Venti goes to sleep it's because Isteroth is awake. 
I could also say that since Fanes, one of the shades of the Primordial One, is an androgynous being with wings and a crown, and since the shades are copies of the Primordial One, doesn't it make sense that Ventus God Form looks a lot like an androgynous being with wings, but no crown because it's not Fanes? Anyway, I think that Piero will use a Cataclysm 2.0 to summon the Archons and the Heavenly Principles, meaning that Venti will go to sleep again, giving his body to Estaroth. At that point, Piero will catch her with the power of the Seven Gnosis to use her time powers, which will allow him to go back to Caria. Now, we kinda know that his objective is to get to the Old World, as he promised Rosalind on her coffin, which means that he may be trying to break Thanos' eggshell, creating the world, the real one, as a consequence, like before Sun and Moon says. Going back to Caria may prove really useful because, as we read in Pale Flame, the people of Caria almost managed to tear away the Veil of Sin, so maybe he will simply push it a little further and the eggshell will be broken, releasing Tevat on the old world and freeing the people from the clutches of the heavenly principles, like Makoto said. And that's it! I hope you liked the video! This was an experience especially from a pro since it's basically in pieces right now. I really can take long breaks while I record because my voice would change completely and you would notice the difference, so I just record the whole script in one go. Unless, like what I'm saying right now, I have to re-record some parts of the commentary the day after because I changed ideas, I wanted to add something, or I had to fix an audio issue, and you can clearly tell the difference in my voice. Anyway, if you liked the video, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you enjoy Genshin Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. So, I have a pretty interesting idea for our next video, but it requires a huge amount of research. I'll have to re-watch a lot of quests from the past, read specific characters' stories, but also books from the game, so it'll take a while. If in the meantime something interesting comes up in the game, I'll put this video on hold and I'll prioritize what's new, of course. Well, thanks for watching and until next time, over and out.